Good evening. evening. You're having a good time yet? Well, challenges are good times too, aren't they? They're growing times, and I know Dr. Sider has been doing that very well, including our workshop leaders, and we trust that it has been a good experience thus far. I can see I informally met Dr. Sider many moons ago through his writing. Sometime in the 80s, I believe it was, those who would become mission partners with the Sharing Way were tasked to the reading of his book. And because of my wife's involvement in the sharing at that time, the book was in our home and I learned about Dr. Sider through his book. I have been delighted to meet him personally through this session. And um, also, I want to share with you this evening out of that in a formal way. Dr. Sider was a born again, is a born again Christian and I was actively involved in the membership of his church, Brethren in Christ Church in Grantham and Oxford Circle Mennonite Church in Philadelphia. In his nurturing in these congregations, he eventually became an ordained minister of the gospel in the Mennonite and Brethren in Christ churches. He is the husband of Arbutus, Lichty said Cider, and she is the love of his life, after, of course, after Jesus. He gives us an insight into his writing and his personality when he says of the signature book of his career and its priorities in relationship with his wife. These are his words. Perhaps all books must be lived before they are written. That is certainly true of books like this one. And he's speaking, of course, of rich Christians in a world of hunger. I must immediately confess that I make no claim to be living out this book, but I have begun the pilgrimage. The most important reason I'm even a little way down this path is my wife. Always enthusiastic about a simpler life and living standard, spontaneously generous and eager to experiment, she slowly tugged me along for her critical reading of the manuscript for our life together, without which this book would never have been possible, and for her love, I express my deepest appreciation. What a warm compliment of one's partner in life. Out of this wonderful marital union, they became grateful parents of three adult children, Theodore Ronald, Michael J, and Sonia Maria. Dr. Sider, please be sure to relay our greetings to your wife and our gratitude to her for releasing you to be here with us. I'm sure you'll talk to her tonight. Dr. Sider achieved four honor degrees and two honorary degrees between 1962 and 2005. He has to his credit 31 books, 70 plus chapters and articles in other publications, scholarly journals and magazines. Besides several recorded interviews, he has lectured extensively on six continents. He also served as co-editor of Transformation, an international evangelical dialogue on missions and ethics. He's a publisher of Prison, Creation Care, and Green Cross corresponding editor of Christianity Today and contributing editor of Sojourners. His professional engagements include lecturer, assistant professor, and associate professor at Messiah College, acting director and dean, associate professor of theology at Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he was the first non-Baptist on faculty, professor of theology and culture, professor of theology, holistic ministry, and public policy, 2000 to the present. As a member of the Board of Evangelicals for, Christ, for Social Action, he held several positions, ranging from chairperson in 1973 to president and executive director over the period of 1973 to the present. He is convener of the Unit on Ethics and Society, Theological Commission of the World Evangelical Fellowship from 1977 to 1986. Besides writing and publishing, Dr. Sider also loves reading, and some of his favorites that inspired and influenced his work are 
Miracles by C.S. Lewis, New Testament Theology by George Ladd, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, circling an insight into his desire for a spiritual life. In his quiet moments, his heart beats for Christians to live out their faith in a world that needs to see a difference, especially in marriage and family in our society. His fears are that as evangelicals, we can fail to live like Jesus if our faith flags and we become tired in the race. His fears are that we might lose the evangelical fervor for sharing the good news of the gospel in our world. Dr. Sider, you have already inspired and challenged us tremendously. I warmly welcome you on behalf of Dr. Gardner, our students, faculty, staff, pastors, and friends here tonight to come once more and speak to us. And may I quote the old Negro spiritual which says, teach us how to walk and teach us how to talk just like Jesus. Would you come, would you welcome him please? Thank you very much. Uh, Good evening, friends. I have actually learned something about my wife uh, since coming here. I knew that her name, Arbutus, uh, was the uh, provincial flower of one of the uh, provinces here, but I wasn't sure which one, and I've discovered that it is indeed uh, Nova Scotia, a uh, little trailing flower. I often say that um, uh, Arbutus, um, to whom I've been married now uh, for 47 and a half years, Uh, has been God's best gift to me after his son. So thank you for kindly mentioning her. I'm hoping that uh, this um, will work better tonight. Uh, Can you hear me better uh, uh, than last night? Uh, If it doesn't work any better, then it's not the sound system, it's my mumbling or or something. So uh, I hope, in fact, uh, it will work better tonight. I want to think with you about a biblical response to the reality of global poverty. And I need to warn you that this is a dangerous topic. If you don't believe me, let me just share this uh, story that uh, Tom Sign, the author and a good friend of mine, uh, shared. He said this is a true story about his parents. They were outside the city of Seattle, and they were hiking, and they came across a whole patch of mushrooms. Now, they love mushroom dishes, so they picked a basketful came back home, decided to invite uh, four or five other couples to enjoy a feast with them. They stuffed themselves, put some of the leftovers into the cat's dish, finally sat down in the living room and were talking contentedly. And then someone wandered out into the kitchen. And there in the middle of the floor was the cat, just writhing in agony and pain. Well, you know what they thought? They rushed to the phone. The doctor said, don't wait a minute. He met them at the hospital and pumped their stomachs for about $200 a person. Several hours later, they were back home sitting together in the living room again, very subdued and uh, a bit uh, sad. And then someone wandered out into the kitchen again. And there in the middle of the kitchen floor was the cat with six new kittens. Tom Sine solemnly affirms that that uh, really did happen to his his parents. Food, hunger, dangerous topic, uh, you've been warned. Much more seriously, I need to start by sharing a fundamental problem, contradiction. There are three realities that simply do not fit together. The first reality is that we have about one billion people in our world who try to survive on a dollar a day. About 30,000 children will die today and every day of starvation and diseases that we know how to prevent. We're 100 to 150 times as rich as they are. That's one reality. The second reality is that the Bible is just full of hundreds and hundreds of verses, Rick Warren says thousands of verses, about God's special concern for the poor. The third reality 
is what North American Christians are doing. We've been giving less and less as we have grown richer and richer in the last four decades. I don't have precise stats for Canada, but in the United States in 1969, the average church member was giving 3.1% of their income. It's gone down year by year as, we gotten, as we've gotten richer and richer, and now it's about 2.6%. Evangelicals used to be almost twice as good as the average church person, but they've moved toward the norm very, very rapidly. My friends, those three things just don't fit together. I know a little girl by the name of Sonia. She was born in one of the poorest countries in Latin America. In her country, and in many others, the infant mortality rate is nine times what it is in Canada and the United States. And so thousands die every day. Sonia did not die of hunger. She's my adopted daughter. She's a beautiful 33-year-old woman, has a wonderful little daughter, 14-month-old uh, granddaughter who's the most beautiful granddaughter in the world. But thousands and thousands, millions every year of people who grow up in places where Sonia grew up do die of starvation and malnutrition and diseases we know how to prevent. Let me tell you about two other stories. Erasmus da Silva was a poor mother in a slum in Rio de Janeiro. And day after day she had to listen while her children begged her for food and she didn't have it. And finally she said, I want to kill myself. She just couldn't stand not being able to provide food for her children. The other woman is Mrs. Kumar. I met her in 1995 in a very poor village outside the big city of Bangalore in India. It was just a tiny one-room house, but I could see improvements all around. And she proudly told me the story through a translator. She said that they had gotten a loan of $219 from a Christian micro-loan agency, and they had purchased a bicycle and a sound system because their neighbors, when they had a celebration of some sort, needed a sound system. They didn't have it. And so for a small fee, they would come in and provide the music and the sound system. They quickly repaid the loan and interest, got another loan, a second sound system. I was looking at a bicycle just overwhelmed with the sound system, ready to go out. It was the third loan, third sound system. And all around that house, you could see tiny indications of economic improvement. Best of all, if you had looked at the pride in that woman's face as she shared her story, you would have been deeply moved. Two stories, the bad news and the good news. The bad news is really very bad, but there is also, thank God, good news. And I'll come back to that at the end. But we dare not overlook how much bad news there is. I talked about one billion people, about one out of seven in our world, trying to survive on a dollar a day. Another 1.8 billion try to survive on two dollars a day. Just the absence of iodine affects some 600 to 700 million people in our world. Probably 26 million have permanent brain damage. You know how much it costs to solve that problem? Five cents a year per person to put iodized iodine in their salt. Enough, all it would take would be about the cost of one fighter plane to solve that problem for the world. The bad news is really serious, unacceptable. So what do we do? Well, as biblical people, it seems to me, we go back to the scriptures and we ask what God has to say about our kind of situation. And I want to focus three biblical themes for us tonight. The first is God's special concern for the poor. The second is that sin is personal and social. I mentioned that briefly last night. I'll say more about it now. And the third is I want to develop quickly and very briefly a biblical definition of economic justice. First of all, God and the poor. You know, at the central moments of Revelation history, God acts not just to disclose who he is and reveal the plan of salvation. God also acts to lift up the poor and the needy. Think of the Exodus. Now certainly when God 
called the people of Israel out of Egypt. He was acting to disclose and develop his plan of salvation. But he was also acting, the texts say again and again, because he saw the oppression and he didn't like it. Exodus 3, 7 says, I've seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them. We could see similar texts in the course of Israel's history. Or finally, Jesus. When God steps into our history, Jesus defines his mission in the words of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He sits down and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And of course, Jesus' ministry corresponded to his words. He did heal the sick and the blind. He fed the hungry. He warned his followers in the sharpest possible terms that they too must care about the poor and the needy. So at the supreme moment of history, we see God continuing to act in history to lift up poor and needy people. That's the first part of the biblical teaching about God's concern for the poor. But there's a second part, and that is, I think the Bible also says that if you and I claim to be God's people, but don't share God's concern for the poor, then we're kidding ourselves, and we're not really God's people at all. You say, where does the Bible say that? Well, Mary's Magnificat in Luke chapter 1 says, My soul magnifies the Lord. Why? He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things. There's my first point. And the rich he has sent empty away. Or James 5.1 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Now, what's going on? Is God a Marxist? I don't think so, and neither am I, in case anyone is concerned about that. Actually, our texts never say that God cares more about the poor than about the rich. But they regularly say that God lifts up the poor and the disadvantaged, and they frequently say that God casts down the wealthy and the powerful. Why? Well, the Bible also says that sometimes, not always, but sometimes the rich have gotten rich by oppressing others. That's not to say it's a bad thing to create wealth. I think that's a good thing. But if you do it by oppressing others, God's furious. Or they say that people are rich and they don't share. In either of those cases, according to the Bible, God is so furious that he's actually working against such people. James 5, after saying that the rich and rich should weep and howl, goes on to say why. He says, you've laid up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out. Sounds like migrant laborers not being paid a decent wage, doesn't it? And the cries of the harvesters, James goes on, have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Or Jeremiah 5, long before the days of uh, James, the prophet Jeremiah knew that people sometimes get rich by oppression. And God says through Jeremiah, wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like fowlers. The image is that of bird catchers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men like a basket full of birds. Their houses are full of treachery. Therefore, the prophet says, that is because of that injustice, that treachery, therefore they have become great and rich. They have grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of wickedness. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless. They do not defend the rights of the needy. And the text ends with God saying, Shall I not punish them for these things? Or Isaiah 3, one other example. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people, that is the rich and the powerful. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The vineyard is a metaphor for the people of Israel. It is you have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean, God says, by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor? The Bible says that with some frequency, people get rich by oppressing others, and God is furious. Now, sometimes it just says people are rich and don't share. That's what Ezekiel chapter 16 says about the pitiful Sodom. Behold, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride surfeit of food and prosperous ease. They were rich. But, the text says, they did not aid the poor and the needy. 
in the conclusion, God says, therefore I removed them when I saw it. It doesn't say they oppressed the poor, it just says they were rich and wouldn't share, and God wiped them out. So the second point about God's special concern for the poor is that if we get rich by oppressing others, or if we're rich, made our wealth in good ways, but won't share with the poor, God is actively working against us. That would be enough, I think, to say that God has a special concern for the poor. But there's one more huge step that the Bible takes, and that's this. I think the Bible says that if you and I claim to be God's people, but don't share God's concern for the poor, we're not God's people at all. We're just kidding ourselves. You say, where does it say that? Well, again and again, the prophets say that God could not stand the worship of the people of Israel because they were trying to worship God and neglect or oppress the poor at the same time. Amos chapter 5 is one of the famous texts. God says, I hate, I despise your feasts, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Now those were the religious activities that God told them to do. But Amos elsewhere in his book says they were bribing the judges so the poor couldn't get a fair deal in the courts. They were seizing the land of poor peasants so they couldn't care for their families. And God was so disgusted that he couldn't stand their worship. And that text ends with the famous words, but let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Jeremiah 22 is another interesting passage. It talks about a wicked king who built a grand palace, didn't pay his workers, oppressed his workers, and God was so angry that he sent the prophet to say, you're going to be destroyed and killed. And then the prophet switches and talks about this bad king's good father who had done justice. It says, the father that is, he defended the cause of the poor and the needy and so all went well. And then here's what God says about that good king. Is that not what it means to know me, says the Lord. Now some radical liberation theologians have argued that that text and others means that the only way we know God is by doing justice for the poor. That's nonsensical heresy, my friends. We know God in lots of ways, including worship and prayer, but it does say a radical thing. It says that if we do not do justice for the poor, then in fact we don't know the God of the Bible in a biblical way. And Jesus, of course, put it more sharply than anyone else. He said in Matthew 25 that if we don't feed the hungry and clothe the naked, we go to hell. That's exactly what he said. And 1 John 3, 17 repeats it. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? I ask you, is it not a fair summary of those kinds of texts to say that if we claim to be God's people, but don't share God's concern for the poor, we're not God's people at all? Now, lest anyone forget something I said last night, I want to remind you, I don't believe in works righteousness. I think the only way to stand before our holy God is to trust that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But it's very easy to abuse that wonderful truth of justification by faith alone. John Calvin, and I have never heard anybody accuse John Calvin of works righteousness. John Calvin said that if you claim to have saving faith, but don't do what the Bible says people with saving faith do. You probably don't have saving faith at all. And if anything's clear in the Bible, it is that people with saving faith, people who are truly following the Lord, share God's concern for the poor. One of the clearest, most frequent biblical teachings is that God has a very powerful concern for the poor. I often say that God's on the side of the poor. Now that's not to say that God cares more about the poor than the rich. God cares equally about everybody. But you and I, and most uh, wealthy, powerful people, care a lot more about ourselves than we do about the poor. So our real bias, compared with God's lack of bias, makes God look like he is biased. And God's lack of bias does not mean that God's neutral in real situations where people are being oppressed. Precisely because God cares equally about the oppressor and the oppressed, God is on the side of the oppressed seeking to end the oppression and to lift up and empower the poor. I ask you, how do the evangelicals in North America measure up to this biblical truth that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses about God's special concern to the poor.
Do you think there's one evangelical preacher in 50 who talks as much about the poor as the Bible does? The second biblical theme is the fact that according to the scriptures, sin is both personal and social. Now by personal sin, I mean things like lying and stealing and committing adultery. And by structural sin, I mean things like economic injustice, apartheid, uh, child labor 150 years ago. Perfectly legal, but destroyed people by the tens of thousands, by the millions. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, we had some preachers in our churches talking primarily or exclusively about personal sin, and then we had other preachers talking primarily or exclusively about social sin. And as I pointed out briefly last night, and I want to develop it a little more here, the funny thing about the Bible is that God seems to care about both of those things. And Amos 4, which I mentioned last night, is one of the clear texts. Amos says, Amos 2, I'm sorry, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. He says a foreign conqueror is coming, the nation's going to be destroyed, and it happened within about uh, a generation of Amos' prophecy. Why? He goes on. He says, because they sell the needy for a pair of shoes, some kind of legal technicality. It was legal to sell poor people, get their land, sell them into slavery, but it was wicked and unjust. They, he says they trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. They turn aside the way of the oppressed. Now he's talking about economic oppression, right? But the next part of the verse says they'll go into exile also because a man and his father go into the same maiden so that my holy name is profane. Sexual misconduct of some sort. Psalm 94, 20 shows again that laws themselves can be an abomination to God. They can be an example of structural injustice. Psalm 24, 94, 20 says, Can wicked rulers be allied with thee? Wicked rulers, notice this, who frame mischief by statute. Mischief by statute. Another translation says you never consent, that is you should never consent, to that corrupt tribunal that imposes disorder as law. Or the New English Bible, they contrive evil under cover of law. Isaiah 10, 1 and 2 puts it this way, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression. He's talking about legislators who write unfair laws and bureaucrats who carry them out. And why do they do it? The next verse to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right. It's possible to work oppression legally, but God hates that structural injustice, that social sin. Now there's one other side to what I'm calling social sin, and it's this. It's so subtle that you and I can be involved in it almost without realizing it. You know, some of the nastiest words in the Bible are spoken by the prophet Amos against the wealthy women of his day. He says in Amos 4, hear this word, you cows of Bastion. Oh, really? That's not the way you win, win friends and influence people in society hill, is it? <laughs> but Amos goes on, the Lord has told him to say this, and he says, you who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, that's why we know it's the women, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. You get the picture, the wives are saying, we need a little more money to go on up in the Joneses, and they're pushing their husbands for that money. What does God say? The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, says the next verse, that the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. Again, the prophet's referring to the coming destruction of the nation, and he says the women will be dragged out of the city, literally, with hooks in their noses. And it happened. Now those women probably had very little contact with um, poor peasants. Maybe they didn't realize clearly the connection between their gorgeous lifestyle and the oppression of the poor and the agony of those peasants. Maybe they were kind to an individual person here and there they met. Maybe they gave poor people, quote, Christmas baskets once a year. But they were part of a system that was unjust, and they were not doing what God wanted them to do to change it. And God said, you're responsible, you're guilty. Sin is structural or social, as well as personal. And it's crucial that we understand that. The third biblical point that I want to make 
is to provide very quickly a biblical definition of economic justice. You can be as concerned as you like about the poor, but if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, and if you don't know what the goal is, you may go in the wrong direction. And here's how I try to develop a biblically informed understanding of economic justice. One of the places I like to go is to, to go back to the Old Testament, the agricultural society. Land was the basic capital, the basic way that wealth was produced, and ask, what happened to the land? It wasn't owned by the government. It wasn't owned by just two or three or a few wealthy people. Every family got their own land. That's what the text tells us. And then the text says that God was very concerned that that kind of basic uh, distribution of the land so that everybody has access to the productive resources, that, that would continue. And so God gives them the Jubilee text in Leviticus 25. Every 50 years the land goes back to the original owners, no matter why they have lost it. And then the prophets shout and scream and denounce the kings and the powerful in their time because of the way that they're seizing the land of poor farmers and preventing them from continuing to have the land, the productive resource, to care for their families. And then the prophets look into the future and say, sometime in the future, the Messiah will come. And one of the things they say when the Messiah comes is that every person will sit under his own vine and his own fig tree. They'll get their land back. In other words, what God is telling us here, I think, as a basic principle, is that God wants every person and every family to have access to the productive resources so that if they act responsibly, they can earn their own way and be dignified members of their community. That's, in a sentence, my definition of economic justice. So what do we do? If God has a special concern for the poor, sin is personal and social, and we have this understanding of what God wants in terms of economic justice, what do we do? Well, we have to ask, I think, what causes poverty? It would be nice if there were just one simple cause. You know, it's because people are lazy or because the structures are all bad. Well, it's both of those things and more. Some people are poor because of bad personal choices. They're lazy, they haven't acted responsibly, they make bad choices about sex and drugs and so on. We need to gently but firmly share the gospel and invite people to repent and change. Some people are poor because there are worldviews that don't encourage a proper approach to creating wealth. Now, in India, there are over 200 million people at the bottom of society living in desperate poverty. They're the untouchables. They aren't even in the caste system. And the society tells them that they're down at the bottom because in a previous incarnation they made bad choices. And the people up at the top who are wealthy are up there because in a previous incarnation they made good choices. So if everybody just accepts the situation, then the next time around they'll do better. That doesn't encourage anybody to work for justice. We need to present a biblical worldview and say that every person is made in the image of God and that God is on the side of the poor and God invites poor people to come to him in personal faith and then work to end injustice. Some people are poor because they don't have the right tools. We need to get there with better tools. Some people are poor because there's just been an earthquake or a huge famine. We need to get there with Christmas baskets as fast as we can. And some people are poor because the systems are unfair, because of social sin, because of structural injustice. Now that's a hugely complex topic. I've got a couple of chapters on it in my book, Rich Christians. I can't say much about it here. If we had time, we could explore international trade. We could explore the uh, agricultural subsidies that uh, our rich nations uh, um, give to our farmers uh, in ways that hurt uh, poor farmers in Africa in huge ways. But let me illustrate it uh, with a simple story. Michael Jordan, you know, the wonderfully uh, uh, great uh, American basketball player a decade or so ago, Michael Jordan, in one year, made as much money advertising Nike sneakers as some 18,000 factory workers in Indonesia made when they manufactured many of those sneakers. And when the workers decided to demand a fair wage and form a union so that they could do that, government moved in, crushed the union. We paid less for our sneakers, Michael Jordan made a lot of money, but the people who made them didn't make hardly anything. Or I could illustrate it with the reality of women. Somebody has said that women do 67% of the world's work. Um, 
get 10% of the world's income and own 1% of the world's property. But the structural injustice that I want to especially focus is the fact that probably half of the world's people have no capital. Now, we live in a market economy, and I'm glad that market economies prevailed over communist totalitarianism in the great debate of the 20th century. But if you have no capital and you live in a market economy, you're in big trouble. The market simply responds to the people with dollars. The market lets Erasmus de Silva's children starve because she doesn't have the money to buy food and it simply produces the Cadillacs or whatever for the people with money. Why do people lack capital? Well, again, there are lots of reasons and there's a complex history, but one major reason is that people with power have abused that power. Think about history for a moment. Think of, think of native Canadians. They lack capital because we took their land. Think of the 2 million, 200 million untouchables in India. They lack capital because of a long, long history of oppression. If we think that the market economy is a better framework than a communist economic structure, and I do think that, if we think that, then, my friends, one of the top priorities of Christians must be to end the sinful abomination where half of the world's people lack any significant amount of capital, which would enable them to participate in our market economies. So what do we do? Well, let me answer that um, in just a little different way and suggest that I think we need to change in three areas. We need to change in our personal lives, we need to change in our churches, we need to change our structures in our societies. We need to live more simply so that others may simply live. Now by this time you may feel that this whole thing has become so complex that there's nothing that you as an individual can do. That I think is fundamentally untrue. Remember the story about the wise man who was walking along the ocean and in the distance he seemed to see a young man feverishly picking up things and throwing them in the water. And when he got closer, he saw that was exactly what was going on. The young man was picking up one starfish after another and throwing it out into the deep water. And as soon as he got close, he said to the young man, what are you doing, young man? He said, um, and the young man replied, the sun is coming up. The tide's going out. If I don't throw them into the deep water, they're going to die. But young man, the wise man said, there are miles and miles of beach and there are millions and millions of starfish. You can't make any difference. And in response, the young man reached down, picked up another starfish, tossed it out in the deep water and said, I made a difference for that one. We cannot, as individuals, change everything in our world, but we can make a difference in individuals' lives. We can begin to live more simply so that others may simply live. We can share a lot more to help microloans be made to poor people, to help end immediate starvation, and so on. What you and I do as individuals makes a lot of difference. Second, I think we need to change the church. Now that includes things like church buildings. I once did an article for Christianity Today arg arguing that we didn't need a lot more glass cathedrals in an age of hunger, but uh, they, they actually didn't use that title for the piece, um, even though I suggested it. But that's not the main point. The main point is what happens in the body of Christ. You know, biblical faith calls you and me to live so differently from the materialism of this culture and the advertising is so powerful on the other side that you and I simply cannot follow Jesus in the area of money, just as we can't follow him in the area of sex and marriage, by the way. We simply can't do it on our own. We need the strong support of brothers and sisters. We need small groups where we talk about our money and how we spend it and the needs of the world and the needs of evangelism and needs of overcoming poverty. And in the body of Christ, we can help each other say no to the big lie of advertising and resist the materialism, which is so powerful. We need to change the church. And finally, we need to change the larger society. It's not enough just to change our personal lives and just to change the church. We need to change the structures of Canada, the United States, and our world. 
You know, somebody has said that if you give a person a fish, you feed that person for a day. That's the immediate bag of groceries. But if you teach a person to fish, you feed the person for a lifetime. That's helping them get better seeds or dig wells. The problem is that a lot of the fish ponds are owned by just a few wealthy people. And unless you get a share in the fish ponds, you can't fish for a lifetime. The problem, of course, is that changing the ownership of the fish ponds gets tricky and political and controversial. You know, in Sri Lanka, they had a dreadful problem with malaria. Millions were dying. And then they sprayed the marshes, and the death rate in Sri Lanka dropped in three years by as much as the death rate had dropped in Western Europe in 300 years. Now, I ask you, that was obviously a structural approach of preventative medicine. Was that not more biblical than praying for the sick or building hospitals? Now, I believe in divine healing today, and I'm grateful for hospitals. But when we can get to the structural root, surely we should do that. You know, an Indian bishop told me this story. He said there was an insane asylum in India that had a very interesting way of deciding whether or not somebody was sane enough to go home. They would take the person out to a tap, put a big tub under the tap, turn the tap on, fill up the tub, let the tap running, and give the person a spoon and say, please empty the tub. And if the person started dipping the water out one spoonful at a time and never turned the tap off, they knew he was still crazy. Uh, don't we Christians sometimes go at the problems of poverty one spoonful at a time? And it's half right. You know, people come to personal faith in Christ one person at a time, and that makes a difference in reducing poverty. Uh, and we can make microloans one family at a time. But we also need to change the structures. Don't Helder Kamara, a great uh, uh, Catholic archbishop in the poorest section of Brazil, used to say, when I feed the hungry, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are hungry, they call me a communist. We need to ask why. We need to change structures that are unfair. I said at the beginning that there's bad news, but there's also good news. Let me end by talking a little bit about the good news. You know, we have made substantial progress in the last 40 years in reducing global poverty. In 1970, 35% of all the people in poor developing countries were chronically malnourished, 35%. You know what that is today? About 17%. Massive change, largely because of market economies in Asia. Health conditions across the globe have improved in the last 40 years, probably more than in all of human history before that. Immunization levels, the inoculation against the basic childhood diseases that you and I take for granted. In 1980, only 20% of the kids in developing countries had those inoculations. Today, it's 80%. Fertility rates have dropped dramatically. And one of the areas that I feel especially excited about is what I mentioned with Mrs. Kumar, microloans. There's been a massive explosion of microloans, both in non-Christian communities and by Christians. One of the leaders in the Christian microloan uh, development uh, is a good friend of mine, David Busseau. He grew up in an orphanage in New Zealand, desperately poor, never to this day discovered who his parents were. At 16, he let, had to leave that Anglican orphanage, he had uh, a few dollars. Within a few weeks, he was selling hot dogs in a sports stadium. Within a couple more weeks, he had four or five young guys working under him selling those um, things. By the time he was uh, in his early 30s, he had made his millions. Everything he touched turned to gold. He was a brilliant, gifted businessman. And then God led him and his family to live among the desperately poor in Indonesia. And he began to see how he could make a tiny loan to a very poor person. $35 would let a poor widow buy a little stove, a little kerosene, a little sugar and flour, and she could bake bread and sell it to her neighbors and begin to improve her standard of living. David helped Opportunity International grow in development. It's now one of the largest Christian microloan organizations in the world. This year, they'll make about a million loans to a million different families. David tells me that each one of those loans lifts a family of five by 50% within a year. The repayment rate is about 95 to 98 percent, way above commercial loans. 
I decided to do a little calculation a few years ago. And I said, how long would it take if we just used 1% of Christian income? How long would it take to lift the poorest 1 billion people by 50%? Now, Christians have a lot of money. We're one-third of the world's people. We have two-thirds of the world's wealth. So I said, if we use just 1% of that income, it shouldn't upset the pastors. That still leaves enough to run the local churches. How long would it take to lift the poorest 1 billion? The answer, my friends, is less than one year. We've got the money. We know what to do. Christians today have a huge choice to make. We can go one of two ways. We can focus on ourselves. We can continue to give less and less as we grow richer and richer. We can forget about the poor. That's a huge temptation. The advertising tells us to go that way. A gospel of wealth provides a theological rationale. Or we can take a different route. We can remember God's special concern for the poor. We can use our wealth to empower others. My friends, that would bless others. It would glorify Christ our Lord. It would indeed attract many, many people, millions and millions of people to Christ. Christians could change the world in dramatic ways in the next 50 years. There's no need in our kind of modern technological world for widespread poverty. Almost everyone could enjoy a decent education, decent health care, a decent job. It depends, my friends, on the choices that you and I make. And I think that right now, Jesus knocks on the door of North American hearts who are Christians. And he asks you and me a very simple question. He says, will you let me change you enough so that you begin to share my concern for the poor? My friends, I beg you, look into his face and say with Wayne Gordon, I mentioned last night, Jesus, I'll do anything you want me to do if you give me the strength. Look into his face and say, yes, Lord, please change me enough so that I truly begin to share your concern for the poor. If you're not willing to say that to Christ, my friends, I don't see how you can claim to be a biblical Christian at all. And if you are willing to say that, I promise you, you will find surprising joy. You will improve the lives of many, many of your needy neighbors, you will glorify Christ, you will draw people to the Savior, and God will be glorified. Let's do it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Dr. Sider. Again, we have been stimulated and uh, challenged with the word of God and the passion of this man's heart. Uh, we will take some time to field some questions. The floor is open. Please step to the microphone and, uh, and respond as Dr. Sider fields some questions. Don't be shy now. As I said last night, I don't mind uh, good dialogue, uh, vigorous questioning, and uh, real challenge. There's a book, actually, that was written uh, in response to my Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. It has the delightful title, uh, Productive Christians in an Age of Guilt Manipulators. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you very much for your talk tonight. It was very insightful. Um, I guess my question is, as we're talking about uh, what we can do as a society, talking about the one percent of Christian income uh, solving the problem in less than a year. I guess what keeps me up at night when I'm thinking about this is I heard a statistic, and I and you would probably know whether this or not this is true that our North American culture actually uses one third of the world's resources. That our small little bubble here uses one third of the world's total resources. That's how gluttonous we are as a society. So is the real question and the real solution to this not how we can possibly bring others up, but is the real solution in finding a way to convince all of us that we need to bring our standard of living down and to start there? I think that's a, a very important question. 
And I think there's a real sense in which we don't know the answer uh, fully to that. One of the things that's clear is that the way we have uh, produced our wealth uh, in the last couple centuries has been very destructive environmentally, and we can't continue with that. Um, so we've, we've got to um, be environmentally um, different. Uh, we've got to pass on a sustainable uh, planet to our grandchildren and, and their grandchildren. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to dramatically reduce um, the um, economic order. It certainly means that we've got to do it differently. And uh, we're simply going to find out uh, whether or not uh, with um, wise decisions and technological, technological breakthroughs, we can, in fact, uh, continue or even increase the amount of economic uh, production that we have and, uh, and be careful and pass on a sustainable environment. Uh, Andrew Steer is a friend of mine. He was an economist, still is, uh, with the World Bank, evangelical Christian. And he was saying to me 10 years ago that we ought to have a carbon tax that quadruples the price of gasoline and, and similar sorts of things. So he's serious about the environmental question, but he said as an economist that he thinks this is perfectly doable um, in terms of uh, you know, a sustainable uh, world if we get serious about making the right kinds of decisions. So I'm not, um, I'm a theologian, ethicist, not an economist, and I don't even think the economists know. Um, um, the answer finally to your question. Um, I think it's possible. What, what the, what's clear to me is that we, we certainly must uh, enable people who are very poor to have a better standard of living uh, and to be able to earn their own way in dignified fashion. It isn't obvious to me that another 5% um, or 10% increase in the standard of living you know, in Canada and the U.S. really makes us that much more happy. So. Uh, it may very well be that, in fact, we could reduce our standard of living uh, significantly and, and be equally happy. But um, I'm not willing to, to say that um, I know enough to say we've got to dramatically cut our standard of living. What we've got to do is enable everybody to share it so that everybody has adequate health care and education, you know, uh, and food and housing and so on. And, uh, and, and make sure that we don't destroy the planet. Thank you, Dr. Sider. Is there another question? I would just say one more thing. In, in the first edition uh, of my book uh, in 1977, uh, I've done five editions now. In the first one, I was a little more apocalyptic than I am now. Uh, the Club of Rome was saying very, very uh, sweeping things. Uh, um, uh, some people were saying that the planet would be destroyed by the population explosion by the year 2000, and uh, we were running out of natural resources and so on. Um, I'm more careful with that now um, than I, I was then. Uh, it's not that I, I'm not concerned about that, but I think we need to not, uh, we need to get our facts straight, and we need not to go beyond <laughs> the solid evidence we have. Talked about the structures that um, maintain um, the, the evils that are the things that put people down. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen any models of either churches or um, organizations that deal directly with either addressing that to either political structures or to the economic structures? You talked about individuals who have made differences, yep. specific projects, but yep. how do we bring that to a higher level of yep. um, bringing our governments to um, accountability. Yeah, well the whole Jubilee campaign to work at forgiving the debt of the most indebted countries, most of them in Africa, um, is one example of a very successful campaign. Um, uh, wide range of people, uh, you know, from Bono to uh, simple uh, uh, just people in uh, local churches uh, around the world, many places. The British uh, were very active. There were many people in the U.S. I'm sure there were Canadians engaged. Uh, 
And we brought pr political pressure um, on our political leaders, and they agreed to far more debt relief than um, they would have otherwise. Now, it wasn't enough, there's still more to do there, but um, the result has been billions of dollars of debt forgiven in desperately poor countries, and the result of that has been uh, millions more kids can go to school because money can be spent on education and healthcare that was being spent uh, on repaying debts. So that, that's just one uh, example. You know, you go back earlier and uh, Wilberforce, uh, evangelical Christian, passionate about evangelism, you know, was the member of the parliament in England who worked for 30 years and eventually ended slavery in the slave trade. You know, you know that's big time uh, change. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there are, um, there are many examples of that sort of thing being done. Please. Um, good evening, Dr. Saad. I'm Emilia, and I'm originally from South Africa. I've just moved here to Canada. And it's marvelous um, listening to what you've said. I, I hope that you have uh, given a speech like this in South Africa, actually. Um, but it's interesting listening to you, and I totally agree with what you're saying. My question to you is just this. With my experience uh, being in the church in South Africa, we have planted vegetable gardens and um, on Saturdays, and we have given so much to poor people. I remember even uh, growing up in the household I did, if we don't use clothes anymore, my mom would have us give it to our maid. And one day, and uh, not very long ago, we went back to one of the um, townships. We had vegetable gardens, we planted vegetable gardens there. And everything just died, and it was in a, a complete mess because the people didn't care for it. And, they, and the one man said, well, it's easier to beg because we don't have to do anything. And as you say, we should give more, and that is very, very true because we're selfish. But how do you propose, can we change the, me the mentality of all these poor people because they're in a rut of just receiving and receiving, and they... The, as you say, they, they haven't learned how to fish, and how do you change that mentality? Because we can give more, but what then? Well, again, a very, very important uh, uh, set of questions. And I'm certainly not proposing some kind of global welfare system. Uh, I'm not proposing that um, you know, we ought to just give huge sums of money to uh, poor people. Um, in my comments about what causes poverty, and I've got a whole chapter on that in, in the Rich Christians book, uh, I, I say that there are a whole variety of causes and some poverty is caused by people who are lazy and make bad choices. Now, I don't think it's nearly as much as rich people often think. Uh, I think we often use that as an excuse uh, to ignore the structures. Uh, and, you know, one could talk about South Africa, one could talk about um, uh, any country in the planet, you know, people with, with money and power um, have a lot better access to education, which is the basic kind of capital in an information society. Um, they have um, family connections, they have inherited wealth, and so you know, they have the capital to, in fact, produce more wealth. So the things are stacked against poor people. Uh, African Americans have often said in the U.S., uh, you know, don't give me this culture of poverty thing. Uh, you know, just give me a chance, and I'll show you what I can do. But uh, I've lived among poor people uh, for far too long to want to suggest that the whole problem is just bad structures. That's not true. Um, there are personal choices that again and again uh, are made by poor people that contribute to their brokenness and poverty. And we need to gently walk alongside them and, you know, lead them to personal faith in Christ, help them as they overcome those broken patterns, and uh, slowly, um, the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, the presence of the risen Lord, and the caring body of Christ will help transform people. But it's crucial to see that there are all kinds of, of factors that produce poverty, uh, and uh, I, I often find that the people who are in positions of power tend to emphasize the bad choices of the poor uh, and ignore the structural things. 
And yes, I was in South Africa more than once, and I did preach uh, this kind of sermon. Dr. Sider, my name is Sean Manuel. About 12 years ago, I took a course, and you were my professor as an external studies for my doctorate. It was on micro enterprise development. And about a year after I took that course, I was given an assignment to establish uh, some sort of a development in Kenya. It never went through because there was one person who commented that we ought not to take money from the poor. Um, are there organizations? You mean you shouldn't charge them interest? Yeah, interest, yeah, mm. uh, usury. Um, so I, I really never went ahead with that uh, program. Are there any organizations uh, in Canada that you would know? I've heard of MEDA uh, uh, that would have the perfect balance of not making too much of money, but at the same time use that as a outreach to elevate poverty in Canada. We've now had 20, 30 years of uh, massive experimenting, experimenting with microloans. Um, the, um, the Grameen Bank uh, is a very, very prominent one in Bangladesh, led by a Muslim, a uh, whole bunch of, uh, of Christian ones. You know, World Vision has a major microloan thing. Uh, Opportunity International, I mentioned. Mida, you mentioned. The Mennonite Economic Development Associates do mi microloans. Lots and lots of them. And they, they all charge a modest market rate kind of interest. Now, often, desperately poor people, if they have to borrow, get charged outrageous rates. Um, and that, I think, is usurious and, and, and unjust and unfair. But um, the, the kind of reasonable market rates that these small, uh, uh, that these microloan agencies are charging uh, simply are fine. They work, people can pay it back uh, easily, uh, and uh, I think that the evidence is that it's better than a handout. It's better than, uh, than uh, just making it a gift. Uh, it's almost certain that uh, that wouldn't uh, work as well, that it would uh, simply not be used in the same way. There's a responsibility that comes and a dignity that comes with being offered a loan that uh, you can pay back uh, as, as you are, uh, are blessed and, uh, and grow economically. Thank you very much, Dr. Sider. We'll take two more questions. Dr. Mitchell. Hi. <clears throat> Just um, reflecting on a few things that come to my mind. And um, <clears throat> in Canada in 2005, uh, consumer debt of Canada collectively was $752 billion. And currently it's about $1.17 trillion. So sometimes I wonder, you know, we have this sense that we're wealthy and yet we're so indebted. So that's kind of one, one part. Uh, another is, uh, in terms of our, our thinking about abundant life, um, a pastor in El Salvador had said that his understanding of abundant life is having everything we need to live a life with dignity. And <clears throat> with dignity. And so I've thought a lot about you know, our tendency to define our lives in material terms and in contrast with his understanding of that passage. And I think in some ways we have been so immersed in a culture that is materialistic that our, our, we think in dichotomous terms, in terms of poverty and wealth, as a material definition or distinction. And so I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to that, sort of that definition of, of abundant life. Also, <clears throat> I think that we tend to think that we, we've convinced ourselves that we are wealthy and that we are happy, when in fact, the most highly, the most frequently prescribed drug in the United States are antidepre antidepressant medication. And there's a book by, I think it's Oliver James, uh, called Affluenza, where his, um, the premise is that as we have increased our material affluence and abundance, that the, the levels of emotional distress have increased correspondingly. And he actually, it's a very well-developed thesis because he looks at different countries and their state that they're at in terms of economic development. So emerging economies like China and India, for example, they still aren't facing the same kinds of emotional distress because of affluence. But anyway, so just I'm wrestling with all of those kinds of issues, um, <clears throat> defining our wealth in terms of material possessions as opposed to um, dignity and integrity. Yeah, I... Um I think it's certainly uh, 
the case that there's a kind of near absolute poverty that is dreadfully de um, you know, uh, destructive. Uh, if you can't have enough food, if you don't have enough uh, money for health care and some education and decent housing, you know, that, that's really serious. And, and increasing wealth so that you do have those resources is a very good thing. And I think it's what God wills. Um, but it's certainly the big lie of advertising and not at all the truth uh, to say that uh, the more money you have, the happier you will be. Uh, you know, the Bible is perfectly clear, and every great religion for that matter is clear, that you get joy and fulfillment out of right relationship. Christians say out of right relationship with God first, then neighbor, oneself, and the earth. And the economic side is one part of it, but it's only one part of it. Uh, and we've somehow, I mean, I mean the, the, the huge consumer debt is, is simply um, uh, a measure of how much we bought the big lie of advertising that we get joy and fulfillment through more and more things. I mean, it's everywhere uh, on the screen and in the ads, um, you know, the way they sell cars and everything else is you buy this you know, and you'll be happy. Uh, my bank actually um, had an ad that went like this, put a little love away. Everybody needs a penny for a rainy day. Put a little love away. And I use that uh, in my section, in the first edition of, of Rich Christians, um, as an example of the big lie of advertising. Uh, it just happened that um, a, a couple years later, my, uh, our, our second, our oldest son uh, was one of the winners in a citywide math contest. And uh, the reward was to have a banquet at the top of the PSFS, the bank uh, building, because it was sponsored by the bank. And uh, I sat down at the table with Ted and my wife and looked across the table and I saw the name of someone on the other side, advertising manager, PSFS. I said to myself, I'll never get a chance like this again. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I smiled at her and I said, you know, I used one of your ads um, in a book I wrote. And she beamed. And, and then I told her how I used it. <laughs> and you know what she said? She said, uh, one, it was the most successful ad we've ever had. And two, you're right. Uh, it's a big lie. Uh, so uh, that's why I say we need the church as a new community that is a countercultural community that understands the, the lie of the advertising and helps us say no to that kind of nonsense. Because we can't resist that. Almost impossible by ourselves. I'm glad that you uh, come to uh, the end of that uh, response with talking about community. Um, in, uh, from, from the date of your original uh, publication of Rich Christians in Age of Hunger, uh, if, if I recall at the time of some of the early reaction is about looking at, uh, talk about the community uh, of a new community as uh, a support group. It was kind of at the time interpreted as kind of an idealism of the hippie movement type thing. I, I wonder over, over, the, over the period of time to, to now is to uh, how we mobilize people to move from uh, radical individualism. Uh, a recent book here in Canada by two uh, editors at McLean's Magazine has written a book called uh, the ego boom, you know, that kind of radical... Is it the ego? Ego boom. To, to what we are today is that uh, how, how we become the radical community of believers. Hmm. Well, that's one of the hardest things because North American society, European society also, but not quite as dramatically, North American society is, is radically individualistic um, and the church has succumbed to that by and large. I think that biblical faith combines a powerful emphasis on the dignity and worth of every person with a powerful communal concern. Uh, the Bible says that every person is made in the image of God. 
every person is so important that Jesus died on the cross so that, that person might uh, uh, come into a living relationship with Christ. Every person is invited to live forever with the, the risen Lord. That makes every person incredibly precious. It's not an accident that it's Western societies grounded in that historic belief that have come to a deep understanding of personal freedom and the dignity of every individual. But that's balanced in biblical faith with a strong communal uh, affirmation. Every person is made in the image of God, and God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, so we're made for a community. Uh, and you know, all through the New Testament, there's just powerful emphasis on, on the community. Economic sharing is crucial to what it means to be part of the body of Christ. Um, Paul says in Ephesians 3 that uh, understanding and living out the reality of this new multi-ethnic community that transcends the hostility between Jew and Gentile, that, that's part of the gospel. That's part of the mystery that he preaches. So we have to balance uh, the two. And it seems to me that we, we do that partly by our preaching so that, uh, you know, as pastors, uh, you're really called to preach about the reality of... Uh, the body of Christ and communal understanding and the economic sharing and so on that must be a part of um, biblical faith. But then we have to figure it out and actually live it. And that means wrestling with, I think, I'm a small group nut. I think that small groups is one of the best ways to in fact uh, work at uh, getting beyond that uh, radical individualism and uh, submitting oneself in significant ways to the advice of the brothers and sisters. That's a long task and it's not easy, but uh, if we're going to, I think if we're going to survive as Christians, either in the area, that is, if we're going to live like Christ, even close, in the area of money and material things, or in the area of sex and marriage, we don't have a ghost of a chance unless we rediscover the church as Jesus' new countercultural community and discover structures within the body of Christ to help each other, in fact, live Jesus' way rather than the way of this world. Let's give Dr. Sider another applause for his...